Good morning. Once again, welcome you to the online service for Bartley Christian Church. And this morning, wherever you are, in whatever place that you are sitting in, watching, joining in this service, may I invite you to just come before the Lord and be still, even for a moment, as we draw near to worship Him. Take just a few seconds, perhaps, and let's remind ourselves that we are gathered here today to listen. God speaks even through the background noise of the world around us, whatever they may be. So Lord God, in this short time together, open our ears, open our eyes to see your vision for this place and our part within it. Teach us, hear our prayers, and enable us for service wherever you take us to the praise and the glory of your name. We are into a new segment of a theme in our worship uh, this morning. Uh, we are going to focus on the next gen, the next generation, the younger folks in our, our church. And we have this series called Titus Series, uh, in which the focus is on godly, godlessness to godliness. And I thought with the focus on the young people, it would probably be wonderful for us to re be reminded of a passage in the Bible uh, that talk about young people and the strength of young people as we draw near to the Lord in worship. And so let's come before him uh, with Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to verse 31. Isaiah 40, verse 28 to 31 as a call to worship. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Father God, in the meeting of our lives, be the focus of all that we are. Even in the singing of the hymns, in the prayers that we shall be making, the reading and the preaching of your word, speak to us, encourage us, and help us, Lord, once again to experience what it means to come before you with hope and renewed strength like the youth. Help us, Lord, to leave this place later on, soaring on wings like eagles, running and not growing weary, and walking and not being faint. Thank you for being our everlasting God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join in the worship together. Good morning, church. Welcome to Bartley Christian Church online service. And most of us are just longing to return to on-site service, aren't we? Where we're able to come together and sing without mask. But we know that we have to wait. And yet the call to worship God never change because He who is the everlasting God, His praiseworthiness never changes. Amen. And we recall, this is what the psalmist says in Psalms 90. Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever You had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. 
wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting Everlasting God, yes, everlasting in His power, everlasting in His presence, you, Lord. everlasting in His justice, everlasting in the peace that He gave, everlasting in His righteousness, Amen. everlasting in His love. As the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through Him are believers in God, who raise Him from the dead and give Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God.
Good morning, church. Welcome to the Lord's table where we'll be having communion together. For those of you who are watching online, you might want to pause the video for a moment and go and collect your elements from your home. If you have some bread, some grape juice or ribena, and then come back and join us. For parents, this is a good time to get your children to participate and observe communion together as a family. That as we gather around the table, we take time to remember the Lord Jesus 
as said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26, which I read, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, in the busyness of work or home-based learning or the activities that we that require our time, we can forget about the significance of what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's why we are encouraged to take communion as often as we need to, so that we are reminded that our faith in, in hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here at, at communion, we remember two things that are very important. First is the bread, which symbolizes Jesus' body broken for us. Jesus' death meant he took our place for punishment of sins which we have committed. And second is the wine, which symbolizes the new covenant by his blood, not of animals, but of the blood of the Son of Man. By his blood, we are forgiven. And when we remember these things, we are forever grateful. So today, we want to remember, in some sense, why he did it, which is his, Jesus um, took our sin and he took it upon himself that led to his death. And how he did it, how he gave us salvation, was by using his own blood to purchase for us. And therefore, communion reminds us of this important truth. This truth that gives us hope even in the midst of a global pandemic. The truth that points to the one who conquered sin and death and gave us the courage to live out our faith that we may in turn be signposts that proclaim God's amazing grace and power. So let us then draw near to God with sincere hearts, filled with thanksgiving, knowing that what we have is we have been saved by grace. So to, so to all who are believers and disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, my brothers and my sisters, let us take this bread and cup in remembrance of Him. Let's partake of communion together. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for sending your Son to us, that by his death on the cross, we have forgiveness of sins, pardon from punishment, and a chance to have a new life in him. Today, we remember his love displayed on the cross, how he willingly laid down his life for us, and we are forever grateful. Holy Spirit, help us to live our lives in a way that will honour you and help people know who you are and that you are real. Thank you for all that you have done and will do in our lives. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go forth and be living signposts of God. God bless.
on the same night where our Lord instituted the communion, He also took the basin and the towel and began washing His disciples' feet, making it an objective lesson of servant leadership, which is what He told them earlier. He said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentile lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Thank you. 
Church, it's time for us to also come before the Lord to worship Him in our giving. And so right now, even as the QR code is uh, shown to us, let's take time to just come before the Lord prepared to give to Him, to offer to Him, and to worship Him through all that He has blessed us with. Make this even a very meditating time of giving Him your honour, your worship, even your all to Him. Let's come before Him in prayer as we all commit our offering to the Lord in prayer, as well as pray, especially for the next generation of young people in our midst, and prepare ourselves for the sermon. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank You for Your great blessing upon our lives. We are grateful to You, Lord, that we can even join in this service this day. Grateful to You for the health that you address us in. Grateful to you for every food, every shelter, every clothing you have blessed us with. Grateful to you for relationships that we can born with. Grateful to you for a part of you, your spirit that lives in us. Grateful to you for the word of God that we can open to every day. And we thank you, God, even right now that you have given us beyond what we could enjoy and to give back to you as an expression of our worship and our gratefulness to you. We pray, O God, that indeed you be greatly blessed through our worship in different forms. This morning, Lord, and this month, as we focus on the next generation, Lord, we just want to pray, especially for the young people in our midst. We pray for the young kids in our kingdom jewels, the children ministries. We pray, oh God, especially many of them are even right now enjoying perhaps their so-called June holidays, but in a very special, uh, restricted manner. Lord, we want to pray that you continue to not only grant them rest and joy in you. You help them, Lord, to even learn to grow, to appreciate you, in in the limitations of their household, as they stay in house, in their own homes, the Lord, they too, will enjoy you, enjoy the presence of uh, one another and their family members. And Lord, we want to pray that uh, even every one of them, through this period of time, will come to a special, special tuning in to you and who you are, become attuned to you and who you are. We pray for our youth. Lord, many of them, some of them, are even uh, preparing for major exams, especially those uh, taking their O's and their A levels this year and uh, under this kind of circumstance of the COVID restriction. Lord, we want to pray for your empowerment upon them, discipline upon them, and help of them even as they prepare for their exams. We want to pray also for youth, even as they use their time in this time of a holidays or so, the Lord, they too, will be able to be good users of their time, good stewards of their time. We pray for those who are in tertiary institutions, the polis, the universities, whether they are having rest or having their term right now, anoint them, empower them, even for their works and for their studies. Grant them much joy in walking with you, in becoming your light and your salt, to their friends as well. We pray for our young adults. Lord, many of them are still working, perhaps from home. Many of them, this may be just their first few years of work and they are just adjusting to to working life. Lord, we want to pray that even then, you will also use them also as your witnesses in the workplace, in the marketplace, whether they are working from home or whether they are working on-site in any manner. So help them, Lord, bless them in their walk with you. And God, this morning, as we come before you with your word that will be preached to us, we pray for your unction upon our speaker. 
Dr. Justin Lee. We pray the Lord you'll use him to both engage us in your word and help us, Lord, to draw us to be engaged by your word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we have a very privilege of uh, inviting uh, speaker, Dr. Justin Lee. Dr. Justin Lee is actually a Korean-American from Los Angeles, California, and uh, he has been teaching in the Singapore Bible College since 2019. Prior to coming to Singapore, he studied, he researched, and he taught in the United Kingdom and in Germany. And uh, Dr. Justin is trained in patristics, and uh, that's really the studies of the writings of the church fathers. And he's also very interested in Asian and uh, Asian American theology. And, uh, and uh, he enjoys reading sports, especially at the American ones, eating good food, and exploring. And we're so glad that he has explored his way all the way to Singapore and this morning to be with us in Butley Christian Church. So let's welcome Dr. Justin Lee. Okay, sorry, sorry. I thought I turned it on, but I didn't. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, I was not paying attention uh, to the technical stuff as well as I could have. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here this morning. Um, I can share with you guys that I have actually uh, been here before as a, as a visitor, and that I have also uh, worshipped with all of you guys uh, online before on, on more than one occasion. So. Uh, this is not the first time that we are here worshiping together, uh, although uh, in today's situation, it's a little bit um, different, and I don't see as, as, as quite as many faces, but I know that there are very many of you online here and that we are here together in spirit. Uh, for today, let me uh, first uh, read for us uh, God's word, which is Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and then we will pray to begin our, our, our sermon today. So let me read the text for us for today. <clears throat> uh, Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Uh, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunken or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, as we come before you this morning, we ask that you would speak to us through your word. Uh, speak, you speak and not me. Um, convict our hearts, move us in the directions that you want us to move, and help us to be attentive and obedient. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, let me start by asking us a quick question. What makes a good leader? How do we evaluate and choose the people who will lead our churches? What characteristics or traits do we value, whether moral or character traits, or even leadership uh, or capabilities and, and skills? We all know that leadership matters, right? Good leaders can help your church or your organization succeed and thrive while bad leadership can leave you recovering for years. And so while selecting e leaders is not an easy thing, it's something that we all do actually quite often. All groups of people do need leaders. But what do we look for and value in potential leaders? Are they good, godly, and biblical things? And are our understanding of leadership based more on the Bible and on the example of Christ or in the world and what it tells us. 
Now, our passage today, Titus 1, consists of specific instructions that Paul is giving to his disciple Titus about selecting elders in the church. Now, to give you guys a little bit of background, uh, Titus, along with 1st and 2nd Timothy, make up what are called the pastoral epistles. Paul, writing on later in his ministry, uh, is, is directing uh, very personal and practical letters to help two of his beloved disciples in their ministering and teaching of the churches that they're overseeing. They are, in essence, taking over some of the work that Paul himself has been doing. All of the pastoral epistles strongly emphasize godly character and example, the importance of sound teaching and preaching, often in the face of false teaching, and the ministry of caring for the flock. Now, the character Titus doesn't actually appear in the book of Acts, but he is mentioned briefly in Galatians 2 as having an accompanied Paul to Jerusalem and appears throughout 2 Corinthians where he seems to be a model of dependability for Paul. And so while Paul calls both Titus and Timothy his true children, uh, which is in verse 4, the verse right before this, and Titus and Timothy, the, and 1 Timothy, the books are quite similar, there are some differences between them. So for example, Timothy is a little bit longer, it contains a lot more personal encouragement, while Titus tends to be shorter and more to the point. Maybe this is because of their closeness, maybe it's their history, personality. But the point to remember is that in both situations, in both books, Paul's concern is to build up these brothers and to encourage them in their ministry. Uh, so setting the context for our passage and the qualification of eldership, uh, in verse five, Paul is speaking of the task that he's giving, sorry, um, to Titus in two parts. Number one, to put what remains in order, and number two, appointing elders in every town. These might be two unrelated tasks. Maybe elders are the ones who are helping to bring order, but we see here that Titus is overseeing multiple churches on Crete, and that leadership in churches is intended to be plural and to be shared. Leaders in the church are not meant to be superhuman, although sometimes we might think they are, although sometimes we might uh, overestimate what leaders do. But there is very clear precedence for this, this sharing of ministry uh, and leadership, this idea of empowering others. I think about Moses in Exodus 18 and the appointing of elders. Think about Moses and the training up of Joshua. Um, even Jesus' ministry was not done by himself, but with the 12 and the 72 and, and others. Um, and so it's after establishing this point, this idea of needing to uh, share this leadership, this need to empower leaders, that, that Paul gives Titus the qualification for elders. Now, before we get into these qualifications, there are two points that I need to sort of point out here. Uh, one, a personal point, and one, a textual point, right? Now, number one, speaking on the topic of leadership can be a sensitive thing, right? If you are a bit too specific, it can sometimes be seen at, as taking shots at specific people or situations and circumstances. And that's probably why I, as an outsider, am here. I can say with honesty that I don't really know the leadership. I don't know what goes beyond closed doors. I don't know enough about situations in Bartley to be taking shots at anybody or to be saying anything specifically critical, critical about anybody in particular. Okay? Um, also, I am not an elder in the traditional sense, right? Um, I am actually a younger, youngish person. I am, by generation, a millennial. But I have pastored for a number of years. I am a leader of sorts in my teaching at SBC. Um, and I have, to, I have to admit that any criticisms I bring up, anything I say negatively, is directed first at myself before it is directed at anybody else. Secondly, the textual point. When we talk about this idea of elder in our passage, we have to be aware that it might not mean the exact same thing as eldership in our modern understanding, although everything said about elders might apply to those who we think of as elders, right? In the New Testament, the idea, the word elder uh, literally means an older man, okay? Um, but the role of the elder quickly became a mainstay, a normal thing in the early church, likely influenced by the leadership of elders in the Jewish synagogues. Now, when we think of elder today, we probably do think of a role that's maybe entirely different from pastor. But in the New Testament usage, it's not really all that different 
For example, in Titus 1, uh, later on in our passage, verse 7, I think, elders are also called overseers. The First Timothy 3 list of qualifications is for specifically overseers or the episkopos, episkopoi, from which we get episcopal. Um, and additionally, elders are those who, by their function, shepherd or pastor the flock. Um, another passage that comes to mind is Ephesians chapter 4, specifically verse 11, and the fivefold or maybe even fourfold role of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and shepherd teacher does not specifically include elder, but in terms of their functions, do overlap probably with the last two. And another point about this is that in the church after the New Testament, the earliest church after the New Testament, there is a quite consistent pattern of elders, a group of elders governing over local congregations. So we can see here that Paul's qualifications here are not specifically just for those who serve in the elder capacity in our churches today, but also for for pastors as well, anyone who is watching over or leading or shepherding the flock. So let's move on to our text. Verses 6 through 9, therefore, are a list of qualifications that Paul gives for uh, for Titus uh, for those who he's going to appoint as elders in the churches in Crete. Starting from verse six, Paul begins with this. If anyone is above reproach, right? We'll stop there. Now, the word for above reproach can also be translated as blameless. It doesn't mean that someone's perfect, but that they are unimpeachable or that they're not open to attack or criticism. Basically, it means someone has lived their life in a generally respectable and upright way. They haven't gotten into conflict, they haven't caused trouble, No one can accuse them of anything bad or bring any charges against them. Simply put, the person is an upstanding member of the community. It doesn't say anything about them having amazing giftings or accomplishments, but that their moral reputation is solid and has earned them respect within the community. Now, some scholars point out that this word, above reproach, is at the heart of the qualifications that Paul lists in this passage, seen in his repeating of this uh, word in verse seven. And I am inclined to agree with this. Uh, In fact, we can see that this idea of above reproach or blamelessness can actually apply to the rest of the list. For example, in the next verse, verse seven, that one uh, an elder is irreproachable, above reproach in home and family life, that in their moral character, verses seven through eight, they are above reproach, or even in their devotion to God's word, in their teaching of it, in their instruction of it, that they are also above reproach. Now, one thing that some of you guys might have noticed or maybe might be thinking about is why exactly Paul, in his qualifications for leadership for elders, doesn't actually make any direct references to Jesus or to things that are maybe more specifically Christian. One thing that I can say is if you read carefully, if you're paying attention deeper within the text, we might see that this language is actually implied throughout. The ethic of Christ is implied, especially in this word, in this language, above reproach or blamelessness. Some examples. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, tells us that Jesus is the Lamb of God who offered himself without blemish, right? Um, uh, Holy, holy, sorry, uh, without blemish uh, to God. That through his death, as Colossians 1.22 tells us, that he presents us holy and blameless and above reproach before him, right? This idea here is that Christ, as the unblemished lamb, in his own perfect blamelessness, allows us also in a similar way to be perfect and blameless before God. That therefore, being blameless in this way is not an independent characteristic, but is related to who we are in Christ, and therefore that we are seeking, as 1 Corinthians 1.8 tells us, blamelessness. Or similarly, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verses 2-4, to 4, that Christ is the great shepherd, and that those under him, as elders and pastors and leaders, can now serve as his under-shepherds, shepherding the, uh, the flock for Christ's sake and for their sake as part of this idea of their blamelessness. And the one thing that we can know is this idea of priestly service, this idea of being people who help to mediate is implied in all of this language, which is, which is something important to know. So, so it is there, though subtly, um, and we'll see how else it is, it is present. So let's, let's look at the rest of the text. Moving on to verse 6. Blamelessness in family life. 
Now, in verse 6, we, we see how one of the qualifications um, is uh, blamelessness and orderliness um, with regard to family matters. There are debates over what husband of one life means here. Uh, I'll give you five basic interpretations. Number one, that it might be referring to polygamy, right, having more than one, one, one wife. Number two, that it could be saying that leaders must be married. Number three, that it might be prohibiting from eldership those who divorce and remarry, or four, widowers who remarry, or number five, a most basic interpretation is marital faithfulness, that elders are people who are faithful to the wives that they already have. Now, it's not likely that number two, this idea of must being married is correct because we know that Paul himself was unmarried and that in 1 Corinthians 7, he teaches that those who are unmarried should and maybe could remain unmarried. Um, and it's, but it's likely that Paul is addressing an audience in which the majority of men, the majority of people who could be leaders, would actually be married rather than it being necessary. It, the fun fact is that the only church that really enforces this is actually the Orthodox Church, in which those who are priests in the Orthodox Church must actually be married. Now, um, I think that we can say safely then that this idea of polygamy or this idea of marital faithfulness are definitely deal breakers for those who want to be leaders or elders. You can't have more than one wife. You cannot be unfaithful to your wife. But what about divorce and remarriage? Now, to say that remarriage is always a sin is untrue. In fact, Paul encourages young widows to marry in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And we know that in certain circumstances, divorce is permitted. For example, adultery in Matthew 19, or say, even abandonment in 1 Corinthians 7. Now, I don't want to get into this in great detail, and I don't want to be very dogmatic on this point, but I do want to note that on the point of divorce and remarriage, some churches are quite strict about this with their leadership. Others are a bit more flexible, and I think situations will typically be a bit case by case because they are not all the same. So instead of giving you guys a definitive answer on what Paul might be saying here, this is, I think, the better option is for us to actually look at this idea of being above reproach or blameless as a sort of hermeneutical key for trying to understand what's going on here. What is the reputation with regard to marital status of an individual in question who is maybe being thought about as leadership? Does their marital status or history affect their reputation or possibly even compromise the witness of the church? For example, is there a difference between someone who married young foolishly and maybe ended up getting divorced um, you know, quickly a bit later, and someone who maybe in their long divorce process spilled out onto the church and affected everyone around them, isn't there maybe a slight difference in the way that we might treat these situations? Possibly, maybe, I'm not going to land anywhere firmly, but I'll just kind of leave that out there for now. Now, moving on to the topic of children. The ESV translates this as, his children are believers, right? And I think this one can be a little bit sensitive of a subject as well, right? I've seen my share of godly and loving parents, pastors, missionaries, seminary professors who truly love the Lord and live out their faith, but who have children who have walked away from the faith. On the other hand, I've seen parents whose faith is shallow and inconsistent, but whose children are quite godly. One thing we can say is this, just because you manage your household well, just because you love God, does that mean that your children will automatically believe? Can we guarantee that anybody believe, will believe given that faith is a gift that comes from God? Now, I think the main point of emphasis in this idea is in uh, the, the latter part of verse six, which says that an elder's children should not be open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Now, the first word, debauchery, in, in Greek is literally asotia, which can be translated as without salvation or can't be saved. Okay? It's not saying that they can't be saved, but it's indicating a lifestyle of rebellion and disobedience against God that's so bad that no mark of salvation is present in their life. Okay? No mark of goodness, no mark of godliness. Um, and this is also supported if we look at the equivalent passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. Paul emphasizes in, in that passage managing, and household, managing the household well. This idea of children of elders being submissive and obedient. Um, this idea of not living wild and crazy lives. Not living completely outside of control where the elders' parenting is not even evident in the way that their children are living. 
Now, an alternative translation for believing is actually faithful, that is faithful to the parent, faithful to God. And so I think what Paul is actually emphasizing here is the orderliness, the faithfulness, the blamelessness in family life that godly parenting shows uh, in a family's character even at times when the children might be obedient or disobedient and rebellious. Um, the point is that those who are not leading their households in a godly way, those for whom faith is really only a Sunday thing, are uh, those who don't bring up their children in godly example or teaching, who show their family one face and show the rest of the world a different face, who are, by definition, hypocrites, ought not to be leading in the church because they cannot even lead their family in this kind of a way. I think that's the idea that we have going on here more than anything else. All right, let's move on uh, to verse seven. Now, uh, as we've mentioned, this idea of being above reproach or blameless is repeated in this verse, this time linked with this idea of stewardship for God. In a, in a way similar to how elders ought to manage their own households, the one who helps to manage God's household also displays an irreproachable character demonstrated in the relationship with the people in the church, demonstrated in how they lead those who are uh, there with them. And so the five vices that are present um, on, in this verse are all reflections of this. They're all interpersonal, right? So some examples, someone who is arrogant feels a sense of self-importance. They feel superior, they feel entitled, they often will look down on others. A quick-tempered person is hot-headed. They're quick to snap, they're quick to pick fights, to be angry, to harbor resentment to others. Drunkenness, I think, is relatively self-explanatory. Violent here is literally someone who strikes another, a contentious person, a brawler, and the idea of being greedy for gain implies somebody who is willing to do base things for their own benefits, that is to take advantage of others for their own financial profit or status, or even to abuse their power for their own benefit, right? All of these things being very bad things. Now, these five disqualifying traits are all sins that are very self-oriented. We can, we can translate them as pride, as anger, drunkenness, belligerence, and say even love of money or love of power. And they're quite opposite to typical Christian virtues, like those in the Sermon on the Mount or the Fruit of the Spirit. Things like humility, patience, sober-mindedness, peaceableness, and selflessness. And although we, as a church, are trying to avoid these sins, although we're trying to see goodness, right, good character, the honest truth is that there are times when these things do work their way into churches without us necessarily knowing, right? There are times where they shape the way that people think in churches um, without us necessarily knowing that they're there. So let me give you some examples, right? These are all extreme examples. They're all true examples, but I just want to share them uh, to give us something to reflect about. Uh, the first one is this. Uh, back when I was in, uh, serving in, 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 in back at home in California, uh, there was a pastor who uh, had a very infamous reputation, and this guy had a nickname. His nickname was Three Month Mike. And the reason why he was called Three Month Mike was he's a guy who would come into a church stir up trouble, and in about three months, he would be gone. Basically, what his, his plan of action was, was he'd come into a church, uh, bash people with heavy doctrine, get people to doubt their salvation, and then by the time that people were in crisis, he would leave and someone else would have to come and clean up the mess that he left behind. He did this a few times until people caught on to what he was doing, and eventually, I think he left to a different area where people didn't know who he was. And I even had friends who went to one of his churches and were severely affected by his teaching. Uh, second example, uh, back when I was serving in campus ministry, there was a leader who came into our church, or not came into our church, came into our campus ministry from the outside, not one of our internal people, and was given a leadership position by the kind of higher up people. This guy was a very interesting figure who uh, we found was uh, lying to and deceiving both those above him and those under him undermining both sides, saying that the other parties were talking badly about each other, sowing discord in the ministry to the point where the leadership and those who are serving were about to basically break off from each other. And so when it was discovered that this was what was going on, they quickly were able to discuss what was actually happening and to get rid of this guy because he was someone who was spreading lies and, and spreading discord. After he left, a few months later, 
one of the staff in our ministry discovered a website that was put together by this guy where he'd placed pictures of our ministry on the website. He basically copied what our ministry was doing almost word for word, but we knew that within the span of only a couple months, there's no way he actually had built up a ministry like this. And so we could only uh, assume that he might have been doing so to, I don't know, uh, attract the attention of, of maybe some donors or supporters who were maybe funding his ministry in order to help him. That's, that's what we think, okay? And the third example, okay, these are all extreme examples, but again, they're all true. Um, I know of churches that friends of mine have served at or attended where elders have literally gotten into fistfights in the sanctuary, where police had to be called to separate people or keep the peace because the fighting, because of the arguing, because of the literal physical restraint was necessary to keep people from, you know, doing even worse things to each other, right? Uh, now, I'm hoping and I'm pretty sure that most of these kinds of things don't happen at somewhere like Bartley, right? And thank God that they don't. But I'm sure that lesser and more subtler forms of some of these things sometimes maybe actually do happen. For example, while we don't have people going around bashing people with doctrine or uh, leading people astray, telling them that they're not saved, isn't it true that maybe a leader or an older person might have talked down upon, bashed with the Bible, right? Belittled someone who was younger and serving beneath them. While we don't have people trying to undermine this ministry in a, in a very specific way, isn't it the case that people sometimes will use underhanded tactics, talk behind people's backs, do things to consolidate their power in order to get things done in the way that they want done? Although we might not have fistfights in the congregation, isn't it possible that people have long-lasting and unresolved conflict with each other, that people have anger and resentment that they hold against each other that sometimes might go on and on and lead to sometimes even arguments or disagreements that actually might be there. So I do think that although maybe we, we don't think of ourselves as being as bad as, as some of these examples, we do have to be on guard to defend against some of these negative and ungodly traits that are present in our societies and definitely do work their way into our church, into our churches in certain ways um, that maybe we might not necessarily see on the surface. Well, uh, we'll come back to this in a second uh, about what this means. So let's move on. Uh, verse eight, uh, the six virtues of verse eight are relatively straightforward. And I don't think we have to get into great detail. The latter three, upright, holy, and disciplined, are very distinctly Christian virtues. They testify of the character of somebody who's seeking after God. The second and third virtues uh, lover of good and self-controlled are actually quite common virtues in Greek ethics. A lover of good is somebody who seeks and promotes things and works that are good, who seeks wholeness and well-being, and I think self-controlled is something that we all generally know. Now, the first one, I think, hospitality, is the easiest one for the modern reader to skip over or to misunderstand. When we think of hospitality in a modern sense, we think of the hospitality industry, we think about entertainment, we think about service, but hospitality in Greek is literally philozenos, that is, love for the stranger. To be hospitable in this sense doesn't mean that you have to have a big house or that you have to have a lot of money and that you're good at entertaining guests. Being gifted at hospitality in the biblical sense is that you are open to serve those in need, that you are generous and willing to share what it is that you have, that you are able to open up your lives to others when they need you to do so. This openness is not just for those within the church, but sometimes even extends outside of the church. And so when we look at the early church, we see that, say in the Bible, hospitality is actually frequently commanded, right? For example, 1 Peter 4, 9, Romans 12, 13, Hebrews 13, 2. Consider this as well. The office of deacon, which literally means servant or even table waiter, comes about because the apostles were so busy serving the poor that they were neglecting the ministry of preaching and of prayer. Or that in times of famine, in times of disease, that the church gained a reputation because it was willing to risk its life and open its doors to serve those who needed serving, those who were sick and dying, whose families had thrown them away. And so the implication here is quite simple. If those leading the church are not aware of the needs of the people, are not also generous in their giving, 
Will everyone else do so? And I think the answer is no. So a, a quick example about this, right? Uh, when I was in England, I, I served at the small Korean church that was there, local church, maybe 50 on a good day. And the honest truth was that financially, the church really couldn't survive because of how small it was. But the pastor that was serving there, the, ma- the head pastor that was serving there, had been there for a handful of years. Um, I knew just, just from our finances that he was getting paid peanuts, probably barely even scraping by every single month. But that despite this, he would always open up his home, feed the students who were hungry, was generous with what he had. And for me, when I think about what leadership looks like, I think of someone like this, right? Who has a small church, has no glory, people are not, you know, hanging on his every word, but is basically faithful, is generous and open. And this is what I think leadership in this kind of a sense, hospitality does look like. Now, the last point. Uh, Verse nine, blessedness in the word and in teaching. The last point that Paul gives is that an elder must be blameless in their faithfulness, oh, sorry, in their faithfulness to the word, uh, that he must hold firm to the trustworthy word I was ta- as was taught. You can't hold firm to something unless you actually know it and you grasp it. This implies not simply mental comprehension that you know it, that you understand it, but that you actually live out the truth of the gospel. And Paul continues that they must be able to give instruction that is literally to encourage or to exhort and to be able to refute false teachings. So somebody who's not knowledgeable in the foundations of the faith and is not living it out is not someone who is qualified to be a teacher, right? Know that there's nothing here about being an amazing teacher, an amazing preacher. There's nothing here about being a theological genius and reading all of the most recent uh, theology books. It doesn't say anything about that. But basically, you know enough that you're able to uh, give sound doctrine, instruct in sound doctrine, as part of your shepherding of the flock. So one quick thing to note, though, as well, is that 1 Timothy 3, the equivalent passage, does not actually contain this particular qualification. And so one thing to note is that Titus is likely including this because of what follows in the passage after our passage today, verses 10 through 16, about false teachers in Crete. And instead, Timothy talks about, in Timothy, he talks about things like not be a recent convert, have good outside reputation with others. Okay, so now that we've looked briefly, quite briefly, through all these qualifications, there are a few points I want to make about this list. Okay, number one is this. It's not a comprehensive list of qualifications. That is, there are many other things that could be included in this list, but are not included. This list says nothing about giftings and talents, it doesn't say other things, anything about other vices and virtues that could be included but are not. So there, there are more things that could be added. Number two, this list is a basic set of requirements. It's a minimum set of requirements. If you are going to apply, you must have these minimum qualifications, okay? The, the, the interesting thing is there are no exemplary or extraordinary qualifications that are expected for leadership in the church. You do not have to be a superstar to lead the church. In fact, we could even say that the qualifications that Paul gives for elders in Titus and even Timothy are are things that all of us can can strive for, that all of us can qualify in, that that, that we should all be able to to have. And the, the interesting thing is what's emphasized in this list, more so than gifts and talents, is faithfulness, harmony, consistency. Right? Dependability. And number three, the third point, it's not a universal list of qualifications. That is, as we've mentioned, Paul is writing to Titus in a very specific time and context to a church facing very particular challenges. While the points are universal enough to apply to all churches throughout history, had he been writing to churches facing different situations, for example, Singaporean church, the Bartley 2021, his list might have been a little bit different. So to give you guys a bit of context then of what this might mean in application for us, do I have it here? No. Uh, In in verse 12, uh, Paul says to Titus, Cretans, that is people from the the, the island that, that Titus is living on, are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, okay? According to Paul, this is a stereotype about the society which Titus's church is in that is unfortunately true. And one thing we can say is some of the traits that Paul is emphasizing, the positive and negative traits, seem to be addressing a situation that um, 
reflects the, uh, the, 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 the negative traits he's talking about here, as well as this idea of false teaching that is seemingly rampant in the churches in this time. So, so one thing I wanted to, 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 to ask us to think about a little bit is to bring this back for us to the here and to the now. What does this look like in our context here? So let's think. What are some negative social and cultural traits that Singaporeans are known for that might work their way back into church? I have a few suggestions, okay? Here's one. Do we, in society and in leadership, place overdue value on things like career, like wealth and success? Do we maybe lean towards arrogance in the negative traits in Paul's list? Is a church and even leaders in Singapore quick to nod yes to Paul's list of virtues, but in reality lean more towards valuing worldly markers of success? Would we choose the Davids and the Abrahams and these other underqualified people, the 12 disciples, for example, or would we pick Saul, who looks good in the eyes of the world, but before God maybe is not as good? Is church leadership restricted to businessmen and doctors and lawyers and high-powered executives, or do we also respect and lift up people who are less successful, less valuable in the world's eyes? Do we devalue people who society tells us are less important, whether cleaners or foreign domestic workers or the elderly or the disabled? Do we recognize that lower people in society, especially those who have served faithfully in whatever roles they're in, um, humbly and faithfully, might actually make more biblical leaders than those who claim to have great leadership on their CVs. Here's another one. Are we too business-minded instead of being relational? That is, are we too much about the bottom line and KPI and worldly markers of success instead of being about people and their needs and the kingdom? Are our churches known for being run like businesses efficiently, well, effectively, or about maintaining a family ethos? Are leaders overly rule and status quo oriented instead of being flexible and open to where God might be leading them? There's a way that decisions are made, value, logic, and sensibility and practicality instead of first and foremost being led by the word and by God's spirit. Do we mistake what Jesus wants for what, what we think Jesus wants for what Jesus would actually want? So again, I'm not trying to point anybody out specifically, but if, I, if what I'm saying does hit close to home, maybe these are things to think about. Here's another example. What, how do we value, how do we think about power, representation, knowing what's best for everyone, right? Now, I'm not gonna get into this, uh, the topic of uh, the idea of women in the church, the leadership and women in the church, right? The, the passage is talking about elders in a very male context, and I'm not gonna get into this complementarian, egalitarian debate, but if a church's leadership is all, say, older men of a certain type and bracket, how do you then actively and uh, intentionally represent and incorporate the needs and desires of those who are different from those who are leading? For example, women, younger men, older people. Do you see a need to set up a metaphorical chair for these people in the room when you are making decisions, often for their sake? Um, with younger people, right? Being someone who's still in a generally younger bracket, I know how difficult it is for churches to cater to younger people, especially given all the stuff that's out there, how people are leaving so quickly for greener pastures, or sometimes even leave the church entirely. But in many cases, are these departures because of people who were unwilling to listen, to not have conversations, to not really um, you know, acknowledge the needs and the difficulties that some of these younger people were going through. Are leaders in our churches known for being tough or for being open and vulnerable enough to share their lives with others? Humble and gentle enough to apologize or to repent or to even change when they're wrong? From my own observation, church leaderships tend to be conservative, sometimes because of fear, sometimes because of having such a great responsibility, not wanting to get things wrong, not wanting to make mistakes before God, and instead to bury sometimes things in the ground and hope that it will be taken care of well, right? And sometimes in certain leadership structures, again, not saying anything specifically about here, um, the people who come into power will set up a status quo, a way of running things 
that is comfortable for themselves first and foremost and set up structures to keep people like themselves in power as well, right? This is what the world does. We don't want to be like the world. So if I've been maybe too harsh or critical, if anything hits too close to home, if there's any offense that I, I have made in anything that I said, I do apologize, I really do. But again, leaders, right, the calling of leaders is to not be arrogant, to not be quick-tempered, but instead to exemplify like Christ, right, in this idea of being above reproach, in this idea of being humble, patience, right, these kinds of things. So for leaders, it is part of your job to receive criticism, uh, whether it's fair or not, as Christ was blameless, so you be blameless, right? The, the, the funny and ironic thing here is that the, the, the people who are in front of me here are, are, are leaders and the rest of the congregation is empty, so <laughs> it feels a little bit. Uh, anyways, okay. So uh, let's end on a positive note. Let me, let, me, let me talk about some positive things before we wrap up, right? As Paul notes in 1 Timothy 3.1, if anyone aspires to, be, to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. And let's be honest, right? COVID-19, the difficulties that church leaders have faced during this time is truly a noble task. It's been difficult. Uh, Church is completely closed down, completely online, to beginning to open up, and now we're back in a difficult situation again, having to move everything online, having to track down people to keep up with them, all the different adjustments, it's difficult. And, And we acknowledge how much leaders have strived and stressed and worked hard in order to keep the church together. It is a very noble thing. And one thing we can say is this, right? As leaders set the example and tone for churches, what they do, how they act, what they're passionate about, passionate about, what they value, shapes the character of the church and shines the light of Christ to the world around it. Who you are and what you are known for is often shaped by the examples of faithful leaders. So for me personally, I know Bartley, your church, um, by reputation, as one that really desires to be a light to the community. I've seen that you guys open your door for rough sleepers, how you guys are actively loving and engaged in your community in a number of different ways, right? I know that you guys have missions, right, baked into your DNA, overseas and locally, and that you're a a congregation that seeks to be an image of God's global church, right? How many churches have as many congregations worshiping together in the same roof as you guys here? Um, I know, for example, that you guys uh, are really committed to the Bible, right? As 1 Timothy 9 reminds us, right? i uh, sorry, uh, Titus 1, 9 reminds us, elders are called to hold fast to the word, to encourage, to exhort, to refute false teachings. And I know that that value here is placed on solid biblical preaching and teaching, that the instruction, the preaching and teaching of God's word is central to what you guys do here. And so whether you know it or not, in actions, in emphasis, in stories of faith, of generosity, of love, your desire to be like Christ, leaders, to be blameless for his sake, does speak volumes. And it speaks life. It speaks truth. It speaks light into a society that teaches us that life is all about me, me, me. And so whether you know it or not, by doing so, by valuing such things, you are, we can say even, refuting false teachings in this way. You are exemplifying as best you can these virtues as far as I'm aware, okay? So leaders, I want you guys to be encouraged that the church does take after you in these things and that for you and for everyone else to seek after Christ. And for those who are not leaders, for those who are looking to leadership, that striving after these things is significant and important, right? right? We think about what we could add to the list. Well, for, for you guys here at Bartley, you guys know what your values are. You can add these things to what it means to be a leader because these are things that God values as well and these are things that I'm sure that Paul and all of us know are important. So let's all seek these things together and seek to uh, be leaders who are also uh, blameless, uh, above reproach for the sake of serving Christ and for the sake of serving others. Uh, Let me close for us briefly in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for this time. Uh, Despite the fact that we are separated, despite the fact that many of us are not here because of the current uh, COVID situation, uh, we know that you're good. We know that you're faithful. We know that you are here with us. And so God, in this time, I pray that you would remind us of what it means to be people who follow after you well, that you would help us all to grow into your image, to grow even into the image that Paul gives us here in this list today, that we would Um, be good leaders in whatever situation it is that you've placed us in and that we learn to uh, continue to seek blamelessness, to seek to be above reproach, to seek to be people who minister uh, 
who share and show God's love uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of others, for the sake of, of obedience to God and, and for the sake of obedience to Christ. So again, we thank you for this time. We lift these things up to you. We ask for strength and endurance in this time. Um, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
This is my hope, not I, but Christ in me. On golden shores of sure salvation, I will run to meet my King, freed from shame. And all accusation, he'll give himself, nothing I'll bring. You give himself, nothing I'll Thank you, God, for that reminder that you are all and we are nothing. Church, the Lord has uh, used his word, used his worship, I'm sure, to speak to your hearts. And perhaps even before we go into the time of benediction to bless our way on, let's just take a moment to reflect on what he has spoken to you this morning. Perhaps he may not be a leader, but in all of us, there's a potential to be a leader at some, some other time later on, perhaps. Or maybe we are leaders in our own right. Perhaps it's good to reflect, have we too been blameless? Have we too been above reproach in all that we are doing? What is it that he's speaking into your hearts right now? Express it back to him as a prayer response to him. Let's just unite our hearts together wherever you are, and receive the Lord's blessing and benediction as I pray for all of us. Let's pray. As we take our worship, our praise, and our prayer from this place into our daily lives, may our lives be sustained through the love of our Heavenly Father. May we feel the presence of our Saviour walking beside us and know the power of the Spirit in both our actions and our words. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, before we go into a time of uh, announcement over the video, I have a very special additional announcement just to give to us. Okay? So if you were to look with me on the slides behind me, uh, we have in this second half of the year several wonderful Christian education courses in our FEED program okay, that we would like to offer to you. Foremost, I'd like to introduce to you our feed 202, Mentoring Through Knowing Jesus Christ. Okay, and it'll be conducted starting on the 10th of July, okay, uh, all the way to 11th of September. Five Saturday mornings from 9 to 12 in the morning via Zoom. And the good news is this, it's free of charge. Okay, and we, but we will need you to register so that we can send you uh, the link for you to join in this program. And the closing date is only just about a month from now, 4th of July, so we hope you can uh, join us for this program. And just to let you know uh, that this course is actually a preparatory course for the next course that's to come in uh, Feed 215 on eschatology, which is on the last things or the second coming of Christ. And this is also a preparation for our missional cells 
as we will take on this course and bring it into ourselves to make it our Bible study as well as our word discussion, over 10 sessions uh, in, our, in our mission of cells. Now, let me just tell you this. How, how do we come to this course? Remember, remember that we had just gone through in the period of uh, April, during the Lent period, in the 17th of February to 4th of April, we were reading through and listening through four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we even have you know, sermon series on Mark, and also ourselves were also discussing on the book of Mark itself. So you were ready into the study of the Gospels. And then remember, just this past April and before this series in May, we were talking about Hebrews on Jesus. Jesus is better. And so from the Gospels to Jesus, I think we really need to build upon that and to really know who Jesus is all about. Okay? And that's why we are introducing this course, Knowing Jesus Christ, as a very apt continuation for all of us in the study of Jesus and so, this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about various aspects of Jesus Christ, right from the identity of Christ, who he really is, talking about even you know, uh, the Old Testament prophecies about the coming of Jesus Christ. All the way, we're going to talk about the birth, we're going to talk about the life, we're going to talk about the sermons of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and we're going to talk about the miracles of Jesus. We're going to talk about the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. We're even also going to talk about what Jesus' current ministry right now is all about. And we, of course, will be talking about the Gospels that surround the, the person of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, we're going to talk about the coming again of Jesus Christ. And so you begin to see how this course actually prepare us all the way for the next course that is to come, Feed 215, Eschatology, the Doctrine of Last Things. And this is in collaboration with the Singapore Bible College, and it is a special course that leads to a certificate of church ministry for those who are interested. And uh, we are going to invite Dr. Simon Chant, okay, a, a theological uh, lecturer, to come to teach for us over four Saturday mornings Okay. If possible, by that time, you'll be in person. If not, you'll be over Zoom. Okay. And this is a paid class. And uh, we hope you will also uh, enjoy this class. Therefore, come both for FEED 202 and FEED 215. Okay. And we hope, really, your understanding of Jesus Christ will go you know, and become brightened up itself. And be, that you will really understand who He really is from who uh, the Bible talked about him in the Old Testament to all the way, what the Bible talked about him coming all the way again. Feed 202, feed 215. Be sure to sign up for these classes to come. Okay? And so here are the other announcements, and uh, we'd like to uh, just sit back and watch uh, what the Lord is doing in our midst.